Welcome to uh, our initial, hopefully first of many, Boston Globe hosted uh, Venture Cafe events. I'm Rebecca Weber. I am the general manager of CIC Providence, which is the adjoining space of co-working members behind us. We count over 120 companies as part of our CIC client community. That means there are over 300 entrepreneurs, innovators, and employers and colleagues who are working behind those doors. I'm very grateful this evening to introduce um, colleagues from the Boston Globe who are among our inaugural clients at CIC Providence. They're really important community members to us and they're even more important community members to all Rhode Islanders who receive a Boston Globe uh, either physically at their doorstep or virtually online or thanks to Dan's roadmap email um, bombarding you at 7.30 every morning. We're very grateful for that. Um, so today, Dan is here to introduce his colleagues because it's really important to recognize that there are Rhode Island faces behind the words that they are writing in their publications. And I think this will be an insightful conversation about the work that they do, what makes it newsworthy, and how it's changed in these incredibly volatile circumstances, especially since you all joined CIC Providence. So with that, I'll let Dan introduce his colleagues and looking forward to the discussion. Uh, thank you so much for being here and for those of you watching um, on the Zoom, uh, welcome. And uh, my name is Dan McGowan. I uh, was one of the first three reporters uh, from the Rhode Island Bureau, along with Amanda and Ed. And uh, we are also, Yuki said, one of the first uh, clients, I think, of, of CIC. We like to think of us as we started off in a broom closet on the third floor, and then we've now made our, yeah, we've made our room, we've made our way to like a walk-in closet on the second floor. And I think. By, I don't know, next year, we could be on the seventh floor and just take over the place. <laughs> I think that's a good idea. Um, but yeah, as Rebecca said, you know, we want to just kind of introduce ourselves. You said the most important thing, Rebecca, which is we live here. We cover this place, um, not from a Boston perspective. We have all deep uh, ties, except for our friend Carlos, who will tell us about his experience as a reporter, um, lovely newcomer to Rhode Island. Um, and that's the thing, we, we want to cover this place that we love, that we care about, that we wanna hold uh, our leaders accountable. Uh, we wanna highlight the good stories um, and then cover the bad ones, right? That's our job. Um, and so I think the first person I wanna introduce you to is our editor, Lila Alphonse, who actually uh, is leading the ship here. Uh, and so what we'll do is I think just go right down, but we'll start Lila and then we'll go this way and that way, just introduce what we cover, that sort of thing, so. I think I did this right. Hi everyone, my name is Lila Alphonse. I'm the editor of Globe Rhode Island. I'm really excited to be here today, but here in general, um, there's, so much that makes Rhode Island a crazy, amazing new state. Um, I say to that as a journalist, but it's also a really easy place to fall in love with. And it's a place where people care about their news, are used to being informed, and want to know what's going on, which makes the work we do that much more relevant and that much more important. Um, it's I. This is actually my second go round at the Globe. I was there from '94 to 2010 in a variety of different positions from living arts to national news to the Sunday Magazine. I spent a couple of years down in IT, just getting to know that side of the business and the advertising side. And then I went to Yahoo News for a couple, three years. And then I went over to US News and World Report where I was their managing editor for news for six years before coming back up here. And, um, and it's just wonderful to take all of that stuff that I learned in and apply it to our digital first um, publication. The great thing about digital first is you're getting today's news right now instead of yesterday's news and tomorrow morning's paper. Um, there's still a wonderful print edition, which gives tons and tons of great information in you know, sports and living arts and books and movies. But the Rhode Island stuff you're getting immediately. We're hitting publish uh, as, soon, as soon as we finish vetting it and you're getting some really great stories. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Amanda, but first I want to say hello from Alexa Gagos, our um, colleague who's not here this week, but she does the Innovators Q&A column every Monday. If you have someone who you think would be a great fit for that, please email her directly or email all of us at rinews.com. 
uh, at globe.com. Sorry, skipped over that part. Um, but she's covering business, she's covering arts, she's covering innovation. And um, I think after you hear from all of us, you'll see all the other great stuff that we're, we're covering every day. All right. Um, hi, my name is Amanda Melkovitz, and um, I'm one of the original reporters here at Globe uh, Rhode Island. And uh, Ed Fitzpatrick and I started on the same day at the Providence Journal in uh, 2000. And then we started on the exact same day at the Boston Globe. So it's been great um, working with him as well as Dan McGowan. And uh, I've been a reporter for a long time, well over 25 years. I actually came down from New Hampshire and visited a friend of mine who lived in Rhode Island and in 1999. And I was like, oh my God, I cannot believe I've never been here before. I, it, we just, we did the whole trifecta. We did Federal Hill, of course. And then we went down to Newport, <laughs> went to the beaches. We just, and you know, my favorite thing was actually just walking around Mount Pleasant and going to the little shops. And I was just like, people were so cool. I, I mean, I'm from New Hampshire. If you know New Hampshire, it's beautiful, but Nobody wants to say nothing. No, everybody minds their business. Nobody minds their business in Rhode Island at all. Everybody minds your business. And, um, and that's why I love it here. I mean, as a reporter, there's just so much to dig into. Um, and for a long time, I worked for the journal and uh, I was primarily covering the Providence cops and then expanded to public safety in the state. And there's a plethora of news there. And for the globe, I'm still leaning towards that because that's been my baby for a long time. Uh, but I'm also really interested in quirky, weird stories. Um, last year, I, I spent a night at the Conjuring House with my scaredy cat sister. And I'm still, we are still getting emails from people who are like, hey, there's something weird in my house. My dog's barking at the walls. Will you come check it out? And I think we're going to go do that, actually. Then we got a list of people who are like, oh, why not? Why not? I mean, the reason I came to the Globe is because Brian McGrory, the editor, said, Look, we just want you to chase interesting stories um, that people are going to talk about, stories that really matter to people. OK, that's that's anything. But it means we're not tied to the day to day to day news that, you know, unfortunately, the journal and a lot of local media are tied to. I like being able to run in the other direction from the crowd and see what's going on over here. Um, one of the first stories I broke was two years ago, um, digging into a Bristol man, very prominent, who actually had been for a long time molesting boys and everybody knew about it. But I brought that out and it took a while to dig out the victims who were willing to talk. And then once the first story broke, we found even more victims. So that's what I'm really interested in doing. And um, I'm so grateful to be at the Globe because as a journalist, I'm sure you're, you're seeing the industry is really struggling right now, but the Globe is different. I mean, the Globe is investing in journalism. That's the feedback we get all the time. And it's such a relief to be able to just think about stories all day and not think about, you know, am I going to be able to do this? Do we have the resources to do this? Can I keep pursuing this? So anyway, I'll pass along. Hi, I'm Carlos. Um, I'm <laughs> I'm the digital and audience engagement editor here uh, at Global Rhode Island. Uh, I started in February. I actually came from Florida, and um, everybody always asks me, you know, why would I leave a place like Florida? You know, the great weather and everything. But I actually grew up in Wisconsin, so uh, being around winter and and just cold weather, you know, you kind of you you get to miss like uh, things like fall. So I'm excited to be here. Um, it's been like a couple of years since I've actually seen snow. So, <laughs> but, um, you know, yeah, yeah right. Um, but, you know, I, I came here because of the, uh, the opportunity to, to work with this team uh, of just experienced journalists um, to, to kind of chip in where, where I can help with the digital elements of the stories. Um, I do a lot of the social media for Globe Rhode Island, our Globe Rhode Island Facebook page, Twitter. We have an Instagram, actually at Rhode Island. <laughs> um, so I, I work a lot with uh, with those elements and just uh, trying to get the stories out digitally to people um, since we're a mostly digital production. Um, but that's what I do here. I'll build one on my own. <laughs> My name is Ed Fitzpatrick. It's going to surprise you to hear when you hear my accent that I'm from Rhode Island. Uh, I was born at Lying In Hospital. I just ran by it the other day and uh, grew up in Greenville, where we live with my grandmother. 
And uh, every day I, she would read the evening bulletin and say, she would scream from another room, like, you're not going to believe this. And she would read the headlines about Cianci or something. And uh, it, so at a young age, I, I realized that there was a, a rich vein of stories in Rhode Island, especially in politics. And uh, Lila o- often says when I, we call to give her, tell her what's, uh, what story we're going to be filing, she's like, that's bonkers. <laughs> and I think that should be a hashtag, like, that's bonkers. And uh, so... Yeah, so I was away for a long time working on other papers, Hartford Current before I came here. And then, but like my first beat at the Providence Journal, I was there 16 years, uh, was in the Johnson Bureau covering the central landfill in Burrowville. And uh, the first day on the job, first week on the job, the, the, in one day, the uh, mayoral candidate, Louis Vinagro, the pig farmer, punched a DM official. And the same night, the mayor got caught smoking pot over at the landfill. He told everyone he went out there to uh, get fresh, uh, some fresh air after a school committee meeting. And I, was, I was like, it's so good to be home. So I just think it's great that the Globe, uh, such a good newspaper is adding to the coverage here in Rhode Island. I think it's good for my home state and I'm very happy to be part of it. Uh, I'm uh, Brian Amaral. I was I uh, started in February around when uh, Carlos did, and I also used to work for the Providence Journal. Uh, I'm from uh, Chelmsford, Massachusetts, uh, and uh, so I grew up reading the Glo- reading the Globe, and uh, was away for a few years in upstate New York and New Jersey, but just always read the uh, the sports pages. Even when I was away, just kept up on the Red Sox, and um, being back here in New England uh, was was really a dream of mine to work for the Globe. So I'm I'm really happy to be here, and just like everyone else, everyone else said, there's always uh, there's always some quirky little weird story here uh, to uh, uh, to talk about. I think the story that I'm probably most well known for was that turkey in Johnston that uh, that was uh, going around, and um, I never caught that thing. If anybody has any tips where I might be able to find it, um, that could get me my Pulitzer finally in uh, in turkey coverage. I've been waiting for that. Um, so yeah, that was uh, you know there's always there's always great characters here and and uh, it it feels like the, I've lived a lot in a lot of places New York New Jersey Massachusetts it's the first place I felt like I, I kind of fit in uh, there's uh, some vi- there's a vibe here for sure and uh, uh, just like everyone else said there's uh, there's real characters here but there's also really serious and important stories uh, that we're trying to chase um, and and to echo what Amanda said want to make sure that we're doing the most interesting things and, and never feeling like, well, we got to do that story. We don't have to do anything. We could write about turkeys for, for like three years in a row, which is basically what I did in Johnston and how I got this job. Um, so, you know, there's always, there's always that. And there's always also room for serious in-depth investigative reporting. So. You should, uh, introduced, uh, our team, but I'll give the quick intro about me. Um, so I write the daily roadmap newsletter. Um, we launched that about two and a half years ago now. Um, and, uh, also have, have moved into column writing. Uh, and so I read a lot about sort of the current events of the day and sort of my take and my spin on, on what's going on. Um, I, uh, came over from channel 12. I was there for six years and got to cover some really, uh, fun stories, got to cover the, the race of Buddy Sancy trying to, you know, make his return to city hall. Um, got to cover a lot of bizarre scandals that Ed can talk a lot about too. Bonkers scandals. Um, and you know, I think the, the, these guys just said it really well. One of the things that you'll find, um, is, our team is extremely humble and I just want to sort of tout them a little bit. You have the best reporters in the state of Rhode Island um, on this team. We got really, really lucky. Um, we, if, if you ever want to see someone who is an expert at their craft, go to the police station with Amanda very humbling. As a young reporter, uh, it was really hard to try to chase down a story in the Providence Police Department and watch Amanda, you know, break through doors and be able to do whatever she wanted and and say, I'm with her. And she'd say, no, you're not. Um, You know, I mean, this is a great team. Ed Fitzpatrick was the columnist of the Providence Journal for years, right? Knows this place inside and out. 
Um, you know, we have great leadership in Lila, which is just wonderful to have. Um, and so, you know, the thing I sort of want to get into with you guys, and, you know, this is going to be quick, we want to take some questions from the audience too. But um, I think a thing that we get asked a lot is where do you get your stories from? And the answer is everywhere. In fact, if anybody wants to leak us anything, we're, we're in right now. But I mean, very quickly, you, you know, tell us a little bit about that process. And Amanda, we could start with you. Just what it's like to, you know, how a story starts. You use the, the uh, both terrible and amazing reporting, uh, the terrible story out of Bristol. Oh. How does that happen? Or, you know, Sheila Cianci. I mean, give us, you've done some really impressive reporting. How does it happen? How's the magic work? <laughs> Okay, so it's not magic. It's actually like if what I loved about the movie Spotlight, I don't know if you saw it, if you haven't, you have to see it, was it showed the really normal, boring stuff, which is, oh, look at the files. I'm going to go through the files and go through the files. And I'm going to call these people. I'm going to knock on these doors and they're going to slam the doors in my face. That's really what happens. Um, it's not glamorous at all. And it just, it just starts with an idea and it just starts with a question. Why is it this way? What happened here? And what I found is you'd be amazed at how people will be glad to talk to you. And as a police reporter, I did a lot of knocking on doors of people who've just been through something absolutely horrible. And, and the worst part is that moment just before you knock on the door and you're just like, okay, take a breath. Okay. You know, if they tell me to leave, I leave. It's fine. You know, it's, they're going through something. And I would say 95% of the time they open the door and they are waiting for you to walk through the door and tell their story because somebody's got to do it. So that's kind of how I approach it. With the, the case of the Bristol child molester, it really, I got lucky. It started with, there was a lawsuit that someone uh, tipped me off to from one of his victims that included a police report with all these redacted names. So I knew there was more victims. And the first guy was willing to talk to me and then I had to go to Bristol where I really didn't do much reporting ever before. And I thought who might know who the other victims were. And I went to retired, the homes of retired cops. And I went through and said, you know, does this look like something to you? And eventually I started to find, I was able to narrow down some of the other victims. And then I had to persuade them to talk to me. And um, it just takes a lot of time. For a story like that, it just takes time and questions. And you can't forget too, if you're going after someone like that, is they have to get an opportunity to speak to. So it's getting on the phone and calling somebody and just saying, let's talk about um, this man who said you did these things to him when he was a little boy and calling him back and saying, okay, I get two more. Let's talk about them too. And I'm giving them an opportunity to talk so um, one that we did recently, one I did recently was, uh, I'm sure you've seen the, the story about the BB guns and the kids riding around the city with that. And we all know how that ended. We've seen the, the body cameras. I was wondering, well, how did it start? Like, how did we get to this point where now there's officers under investigation and there's chaos? And so that's where we use the public records request. I mean, anybody can do this. You don't have to be a reporter to use the public records laws. But I went to the police department and I said, I want to see, I want all of your dispatch calls that relate to this. And then I want all your 911 calls if you can give them to me. And we have a law in Rhode Island where the victims have to approve. So they went and contacted the victims and got five of them to agree. And that, you know, I just asked for everything I could and it turned out to be 770 dispatch calls from the very first call that they got to the cops talking to each other about chasing to a cop calling in to the dispatcher um, saying, you know, he just get running from me, he pointed this at me to dispatchers talking to each other in different states saying, look for them. And it, it painted, it just offered more context for the public to understand what happened that whole night and from start to finish. And just to inform you, I mean, you can decide what you think about what happened that night, but we should know because these are our public officials. These are our police. What did they do? What happened? What were they dealing with? And also, what was the rest of the public dealing with? Does that help? Pretty good, actually, yes. <laughs> that's how you do the job? That's, that's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Lila, I, I feel like the one thing I want to ask you as you as you think about what you, what you say, no, 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 same idea is uh the the 
great and refreshing thing about you is you come with a new perspective, right? You weren't entrenched in Rhode Island like many of us were. How much of that helps? You come in with a fresh perspective, you get to see the world a little differently versus kind of catching up as you go. That's a great question. Um, I think that, so I'm gonna let the reporters talk about how they report out stories and how they find their stories and get their tips. But as an editor who's deciding, well, do we need that story? Should we look at this other story? Um, coming into it with the fresh perspective is really helpful. The things that maybe everyone, all the other reporters at other outlets, print, online, TV, radio, the things that they think ugh, everyone already knows about are kind of new and interesting to me. And as Amanda said, you have to be willing to ask why. Um, when I was a very young editor, just starting out, someone told me, um, everyone has a story and most of them are really happy to talk to you about it. But you have to ask and you have to ask with um, the intent to listen, not just figuring out what your next question will be. Um, I think that's really key. I think the other thing that I find challenging and rewarding about being down here is there are a lot of great outlets and consumers here are really into their news. Um, but you know the media landscape is changing. It's changed, it's different. And it's not just a matter of politics. It's not just a matter of finance. Um, Rhode Island luckily is not a news desert the way some states are, but there are gaps and those gaps are growing. And I see our job is at least a big part of it is to fill it. So you might have the, the um, school committee meetings being covered. You might have local sports being covered, but there's an in-between between the things that affect your daily life that you follow, that you know about, and the things that you don't know about yet, but should. Um, you should understand what's going on with the big healthcare mergers. You should understand how what the police are reporting, what you're seeing on the body cameras affects you and your safety. You should be able to hear other opinions. And this is one thing that's so great about Dan's column is you're hearing other sides of the story that you might not be able to go and dig up by yourself. Um, but we've also got a team of people who are relentlessly curious. I mean, seriously, you guys do not stop. It's, it's like 10 o'clock at night. I'm like, can you go to bed now? Go to sleep. Um, but it's, it's also thrilling because we're constantly uncovering new stuff. And sometimes it's stuff that doesn't pan out. There are times where we've worked all day on a story and we're like, you know what? this is too thin. There's not enough here. We can't prove this. We've got lots off the record and nothing on. We can't run this. Um, and there are other times where you pick one thing that's happened, like um, the investigation Alexa just did into the artist exchange, and it has an immediate impact in the community. And then there's another impact and another impact, and the story keeps going. And our job is to keep following it, to keep getting to you the information that maybe you can't find anywhere else. But now, Carlos, I, Carlos, I feel like giving you all the mics. Yeah, they have all of them. <laughs> uh, to go to you, Carlos, one of the things I think is really cool about the work that you've done with us so far is, Lila used the term relentlessly kind of interested in things and, and, and curious, relentlessly curious. Uh, your job is actually to do that, right? You monitor social feeds and really pay close attention to what's going on. And I feel like that's a very new, you know, people out there should know, like, we're really paying a lot of attention to your Twitter feeds and your Facebook. It's creepy, in fact. <laughs> um, so, Carlos, I mean, talk a little bit about that, like your role in like trying to find things that are interesting, finding things that are not just uh, uh, like news of the moment, but also kind of weird things that might click and literally get clicked. Sure. Um, you know, I'm pretty new to Rhode Island, so everything that happens around here is interesting to me and sometimes a little bit bizarre. <laughs> I mean, I mean compared, compared to Florida, things are a little bit different here. Um, but I guess part of that is just learning about people, what interests them, what makes them tick, what kind of subjects that uh, we can cover that people are going to want to read about. Um, so I, I join a lot of the Facebook groups or even like, uh, you know, Twitter, Facebook, Nextdoor. I mean, all these have sources of community news. And I actually live in a pretty small town, well, 
I guess it's small, Cumberland. <laughs> I guess it's like the eighth biggest city in the state. Um, but the, uh, <laughs> I guess to me, it's a little bit small, but, um, you know, just like uh, trying to be part of the fabric of the community and uh, kind of like see where people um, are coming from. I think that's, that's important to me. And, you know, I'm trying to learn a little bit about, about that and still find, uh, I guess, what we call trending stories and, and things that are, are kind of like in the, uh, in the news stream at that time. Uh, they might be a little bit short-lived sometimes too. So we're kind of deciding uh, what kind of things are going to uh, uh, be really, I guess, things that people, people want to read about. Um, but a lot of it, you know, for me is just, uh, just communicating with people, creating sources that I can go back to, whether it be a story that I'm working on or just like, uh, you know, helping people out finding information. I'll do a lot of that on, on Facebook groups. Um, I do, uh, I did a lot of weather coverage in Florida. So during, uh, Henri and Ida, I posted a lot of weather news in groups, um, just because I was aware of, uh, how it worked like, uh, tropical storms and, and things that people, um, might not be aware of because I mean, we didn't have a, a tropical storm here that was named in 30 years. So um, I try to offer that, uh, that help to people. Um, we did that with, you know, a series of stories um, before the storm. And then when we went out to cover it, you know, I know Brian went out there too, um, you know, uh, stepped out kind of into the elements to kind of show people, you know, why they shouldn't be out there. But <laughs> it's bonkers out here yeah it's it's crazy out here you guys should be inside um but but that's kind of like what i what i like to do is just uh, show people uh the things that i know that uh might help them a little bit you know um preparation things like that but um i guess that's all i got and one thing to say is I love that coverage. I come from TV where they tell you to go outside in those storms and it doesn't really make a lot of sense. So I love that stuff. Um, uh, I should also point you guys to Carlos for a really poignant um, uh, kind of first person take on uh, the tropical storm and how it was some, something of a myth here. And that was a good thing. And why like everybody got all excited about this and and it's you know this is a guy who's covered florida right like real stuff happens down there and um it was a good thing that right the storm was a miss and i want you uh to focus on something amanda said a little bit if you can and it's something i know it's near and dear to your heart which is the public records and when we focus on sort of how we're trying to find stories and coming up with things and just going through documents. Talk a little bit about the, you know, sort of the public records process here, but more importantly, what, why it uh, is so important to have, um, you know, a, a, you know a, a, a wide level of kind of transparency in government, why it matters to us and why it matters to the folks that are listening and watching. Yeah, and for, first I'll point out that Carlos, when he was out there in the hurricane, and, and Henri, he uh, had shingles flying at him from uh, the salty brine, uh, at the salty brine beach, so it, it, got, it got real out there. Um, but yeah, public records, Amanda and I are on the New England First Amendment Coalition board, and so we're, we're really focused on the uh, need and, and the, the state of the law here in Rhode Island um, when it comes to public records and open meetings. And, um, you know, th there's a lot of ways it could be better. And, there's, uh, and uh, so NEFAC is one group that uh, fights for that uh, up at the legislature to try to get new bills passed to open things up. And like having grown up in Rhode Island is the only place where it's needed more uh, than Rhode Island to and to have those tools uh, to shed light on what's going on with our government. And um, you, you, and that applies not only to what's going on in the state house, but all, often the battles are in, in, in local governments in the in the city at the city council. Um, and and Dan did such great coverage over the years uh, at uh, covering uh, Providence City Hall. Um, and Amanda is is so skilled at using, like she just gave the example of using the the 770. Uh, records to show what happened with that BB gun incident. And that's a great example where um, it provided the context and, you know, with 
in fact, we were talking about how it took too long to, to get those records. And, um, you know, this is something that's on our radar now is the state police and the attorney general's office is taking input because they're about to create rules about what happens when, um, you know, the police are going to have body cameras on now and there's money to buy the body cameras and it's going to be this new level of transparency. But when are we going to, you know, they are obviously public records, but there's a big question about how long it takes to see those uh, to see those videos. And if it's delayed, like the BB gun was what, six weeks, um, you know, what I what can happen is misinformation fills that void. It's it's what people say happened. But but the the recordings show what happened for good or for bad. You know, it may show police misconduct. It may show appropriate conduct by the police. It can, but it's the truth. And we should get it soon, much sooner than we do now in Rhode Island. And I hope when they're writing those rules and they're listening, um, that they, they, they create rules that provide that, that, you know, the the what you'll hear is that you don't want to have uh, witness testimony tainted by what people heard uh, or read in, in, the, in the newspaper or heard on TV. But th that's a danger, but so is the danger of having all misconceptions, misinformation going out there and, and, and really having the public trust eroded um, uh, by that. You, you wanna build the public trust. This is a chance with body cameras to add to the public trust, very important. One thing I would say too is, is the thing that, that's great for us about public records and in, in turn great for the public is, right, it's everything. It's public employee payrolls. It's things like, it's why we can do highest paid police chiefs in Rhode Island and people love that stuff. But it's also, you know, it's the, it's court documents. It's just, it's everything. It's contracts, all these things that, you know, um, that we can turn into news. And I think uh, I love, there's a saying I love about there's no data without a story to be told and there should be no story without data to back it up. And I think it's really important. I think we try our best to do that work. Um, I want to do audience questions, but Brian, you're kind of the last person on this. And the thing I want you to bring us to is you're suddenly our resident beach access. Um, I'm a beacher expert. today for, uh, for that reason, <laughs> beach weather. This is a thing where you suddenly just got really interested in beach access and uh, it's kind of taken off as like the best niche going. Yeah. So uh, back in uh, 2019, I was working on a weekend uh, at the Providence Journal and I got a phone call on the main line. Somebody said, I just got arrested uh, uh, collecting seaweed. And I said, I'm sorry, pardon me. Checked the number and I made sure this is not a prank call. And, and it turned out this guy, Scott Keeley, got arrested down in um, South Kingstown, uh, went out there to make a point about beach access, got arrested, ends up suing over it. And that story was just like very well read and people were uh, really engaged in it. So I've, I've just written about it over the years and it's, you know, it's just a really interesting topic because it, we actually, like, as we were sitting here, my story posted, uh, I interviewed a guy who owns a private beachfront home and uh, sort of explained what his perspective was on things and about property rights. And, uh, and I think, uh, you know, cause it's, you know, we have 400 miles of shoreline in the state and uh, they're one of the best parts about the state. And uh, some people say that it's too hard to get to them. Uh, and uh, private property owners say, no, I'm paying taxes on that. I'm, you know, if you slip and fall and uh, hurt yourself, I'm going to, you're going to be suing me. And, and so it's sort of this uh, perennial battle that, that I think people on the pro access side have gotten pretty well organized recently. So it's, uh, there's also on the pro private property rights side, they're, they've hired lobbyists and so now it's a political struggle too. So it's, uh, plus I can, uh, put on my expense report a trip to the beach and that's always, um, uh, it's always very welcome to, uh, to, to get paid to drive down to Charlestown and sit on someone's deck and sit in the sun for a while, but you know, so yeah. Um, Rebecca, do you want to sort of facilitate if anybody has any questions or, or does anybody have any questions? More importantly, we got one right there. So and I, I just want to point out that Brian doesn't even like the beach. He's, Not really. Yeah. I prefer uh, I prefer the shade. I'm more of an indoor sort of guy. I'm, very, I'm an indoor enthusiast, but it's why I'm very uh, objective about it because I neither want to collect seaweed nor do I want to hang out at your beachfront home. So perfectly objective about it. Okay, so first of all, I just want to say that 
I, I think the roadmap is just this, it's, I don't know who came up with it and how you branded it so perfectly, but it's like, it is a brilliant vehicle that brings all of your amazing reporting to my front door every day. And I just, it, and you tee up every article. So Thank you. perfectly. Thank like, you. I just read through everything and because I love it so much. Of course I pay whatever it is that month to be able to read all those articles. Right. For those who don't know, it was Dan's brainchild. Great idea. Uh, I have to say, like, it's so familiar. It's so brilliant. I totally love it. But like, I am a, like, I'm a small percentage of your public, right? And I, this is really beyond the Boston Globe. I think it's an industry. I, I, I'm wondering if it's an industry problem, but how do you write for a public when that public, the, the people who pay for it certainly aren't representative my suspicion is aren't representative of all of it, right? Like when I was a kid, you just bought a daily paper with pocket change. <laughs> I'm old, <laughs> right? But today it's different, right? Like, you know, between the New York Times and the Boston Globe, I'm easily in it for $240 a year, right? Like, anyways, that, that's my question. I love that question, but I want Lila to sort of lead us in it. And then I'll come up with something brilliant and then say, and go. <laughs> Um, so I think that's a great question because I think that's a really important point. Um, we, back 20 something years ago, um, we started conditioning readers to expect news for free online, depending on how it was brought to their doorstep. Whether it was an email newsletter, which was not so popular then, or whether it was boston.com, which was. Um, and over time, that expectation has helped hollow out the industry. Um, if you expect your news for free, you're going to tend to avoid the subscription. And then the news you're getting, it might not actually be news. It might be a blog post. It might be something you saw on Facebook. It might be a link you saw on Twitter. It might go to a free news source that's really a news source. Um, there's a lot of unreliable stuff out there. So I think there's a generational shift. Um, my generation definitely wanted it all for free. Absolutely. Um, my young adult and older teenage children are more than willing to pay for their Spotify and their Disney Plus and their Netflix and their Hulu and their Amazon Prime. Um, or willing to have me pay for it, really? Yeah. Let's be honest here. Um, but my point is that the expectations are shifting. And now if you can prove value, people are more willing to shell something out. Um, we also pay for a lot of things on a regular basis. Um, people have a Starbucks drink a day habit that easily totals over 30 bucks a week. Um, right now we're offering a subscription to the globe and that's everything in the globe, not just globe Rhode Island for $1 for six months. Um, yeah, the price goes up after that. Of course it does. Um, but it's still not going to be as expensive as that one Starbucks a day habit, and you're getting a lot more out of it. Um, so I see my job as to try to not just provide that value, but prove it um, every day and multiple times a day. Um, and I'm so lucky to have this Cracker Jack team here that just finds the good stuff and allows me to get it out before all of you. Um, but that's, that's really what we're doing here. It's a, there's the value of Globe Rhode Island, the digital first, the relentlessly curious, the relentlessly interesting stuff that we're putting out. Um, but there's also the added value of the entire Boston Globe behind it, the resources to conduct the investigations, the ability to do multimedia and to reach out in other ways, the ability to parse all of that overwhelming data and tell you what matters. Um, but then there's also those Red Sox scores. People care about those. There's, you know, there's all of the um, the great columnists at the Globe. There's the access to events. Um, there are the podcasts beyond the dulcet tones of Ed. <laughs> there's also podcast investigations that we do. There's love letters. There's a lot of entertaining and interesting stuff. Um, so our job is to bundle all that together and persuade you that it's worth not just your money, but also your time. Um, I would argue that that's the more precious resource for all of us right now. You're getting inundated with alerts and with email pushes and with um, social media and with billboards. And um, our job is to let you know that we've got something and it's, it's worth your time to read it. 
Um, can I just tell you guys that my kind of secret low key favorite part of the globe is our, um, the I don't know if it's weekly or monthly, but it's the, we write about, we send two people on a blind date and then write about sort of their experience. Dinner with Cupid. It is like, it's, I'm obsessed with it. I think it's hilarious. And we went on a push for like a year ago in Rhode Island to like get people to do it. I think we had two or three and it was very strange. Um, one, uh, very funny though. Um, one thing to, to address that I'll be honest, keeps me up at night um, is I care deeply about the Providence school system. I think it's really important. I think it's one of the most important stories going in, in Rhode Island. Um, and I think a lot about who I'm writing for. And you think about a school system where 91% of kids are students of color. And I worry a lot about whether or not those kids eventually, but their parents right now are subscribing to the globe, are reading the coverage. Um, and the truth is don't have a great answer, right? Uh, we need to do better always. I think all news outlets do, but um, it's something that we, we talk about a lot. We, you know, we do a lot of kind of focus grouping and trying to think about how to reach a more diverse audience that, that is, you know, more reflective of what Providence looks like and more what the state looks like. So the uh, part of this is like a little bit of a mea culpa. We need to do better. Um, we are also thinking very hard about how to do better. It's a priority. It's the number one priority, I would say. So um, not a great answer, but it is what it is. Uh, question. Um, I have a question kind of building off of the question and answer that you just gave about um, providing value in exchange for the subscription. Um, what is the thought process or um, sort of key points that you bring up when you're thinking about bringing a story to light or publishing it or um, qualifying it to the point where it is something worth writing about or it is something worth investigating? Um, and the uh, second part of that is how important is the person that's going to be reading it to you guys in that thought process? So I would say that we're constantly thinking about who's reading and whether we're reaching the right people and whether we're covering the right beats, um, whether we're approaching stories and neighborhoods and people with respect um, and whether we're making assumptions. There are a lot of assumptions that people make, especially when you're in a position um, like as a journalist where you're trying to decide what's worth covering and what's not. Um, one thing that's helpful for me, since I haven't been steeped in Rhode Island for all that long, is that a lot of it's super new to me and interesting, um, which allows us to take that story and kind of twist it a little bit and look through different lenses and see what hasn't been covered. Shore access is a great example of that. Um, a lot of journalists in Rhode Island have heard about this and covered it ad nauseum, um, but we're able to dig in and look for angles that maybe haven't been totally explored. Um, fire districts, for example, which which um, Brian looked at recently. I think that um, as a woman of color who grew up in New Jersey and who has been lucky enough to experience a lot of different things in, in life, um, that absolutely affects how I evaluate stories. Um, I absolutely look at stories, we've had this discussion about um, policing in Rhode Island and whether something is normal or whether something is outrageous or whether something should be outrageous but is not. Um, and that I think is something that, um, it's an example of a unique perspective that each of us bring to the table in some way, whether you were born and raised here and ran past the hospital recently, or uh, whether you've been covering cops, courts and crime for 20 years, or whether um, you're new to the area, new to a beat, or whether you took, at, took your first um, journalistic steps here on TV, which offers a different perspective, right? You're homing in on different aspects of a story. You're looking for more visual elements, more sound bitey elements. Um, print and online give you an opportunity to dig in, but you still have to present data differently online than you do in print. 
Um, so all of those different things kind of come together, not just in the morning meetings, I would say it's a constant churn. When a story is filed, I'm thinking about the headline. I'm thinking about what do we do to grab that reader? How do we give them just enough information to realize this is important? Should more of this be fleshed out in roadmap, which is free, so people can access more of the meat of the story and then go online through the paywall to get the rest of it? Is this something that I should figure out a way to lift the paywall on? And yeah, there's a price for me to pay for when I do that, but sometimes it's important. Um, is this something that we can just tease out? Will people on social media be more willing to consume it if it appears on Facebook than if it if we're driving them to our site? How do we get the really great coverage we do in front of the people who need to see it? Because it doesn't matter how great our coverage is if no one sees it, right? So, so who we're writing for, I would argue, is just important to me, at least to our team, as what we're writing. We want to do one more question just one quick piggyback on that though is is yeah one of the totally very good question and the best part of that question is that five six seven years ago that question was well do you, do you just care about what uh you know what people click on and so how come you guys cover so many you know fires and car crashes and things like that for a long time right like the industry was driven by by what drove page views. Um, we still love page views, believe me. I keep very close attention, focus on this stuff a lot, but we're subscription-based, right? We, we want to provide more value because we expect you to pay for it. Um, and so it allows us, I think, you know, we're all on a text chain every day, every minute of every day. Sometimes it's obnoxious um, where we, you know, are telling each other what we're working on. Do you know this person? Do you do? You, and we're always thinking about why this story matters, why it's important to tell and, and, and how we're going to tell it. So let's, oh yeah. Anything? Um, so one thing that they're all sick of me hearing, or sick of hearing me say rather, is that I firmly, firmly believe that a good story transcends location. Um, that a great story about Rhode Island will be just as interesting to people in Massachusetts, in Maine, in California, in France, wherever, because there's a commonality there. There's something that brings us all together. There's a way to relate. And part of our job is to flesh that out and really shine a light on it. Um, so you mentioned assumptions, and that actually ties to my, my question, how do you mitigate bias? Because even though you have data, it still has to be interpreted. So what is your process? I'm curious to know. Um, part of it is being aware that we all have bias. Um, people always ask me, like, what are the most unbiased news sources? And I like to say, none. Ha -ha. <laughs> there are everyone, everything has their own personal bias. We all bring something to the table. But there are news sources that try harder than others to do more than just preach to their choir, to do more, to actually provide information, not just confirmation. Um, I would say that we try hard to do that every day. So I think there's an awareness that that certain stories get more attention. Um, Dan alluded to the whole if it bleeds, it leads mentality that was so pervasive for so long. But the Globe has recently undertaken um, a study of our own work, looking at who we feature as sources, looking at who we feature in photos, looking at the context, looking at whether we're only featuring people of color in crime pictures crime stories, looking at how the stock photos we use and the illustrations we use influence the perception of a story. Um, those are all things that, that we've taken a deep dive into um, over the last couple of years and that I, in particular, um, keep in mind every time I look at a story. Because let's face it, a lot of times the stories aren't written for women or for people of color or for people at a certain education level or a certain income level. And I feel that part of my mission is to mitigate that and to make news and information accessible and hopefully still interesting. But I would say the very first step to mitigating bias is to be aware that we're, we all have some of it and to try to watch out for the certain things that we know we're biased about. Okay, last question. I'm gonna merge two questions from our online audience. So the first part is that Co asks, um, do you find society be society to be more skeptical about certain types of news stories? And as kind of an add on to that, when you're working with a tip from the general public like us, is there something you need before 
like, is there some piece of information we have to give you um, or that makes your job a lot easier that we can give you? So kind of two pieces there. I'm just gonna speak quickly to the, um, to the skepticism part. I think the industry has changed over time, over the last probably 15, 20 years, not just the last five. Everyone talks about the last five. It really started much earlier than that. Um, there was a turn towards infotainment that even the big major cable networks um, embraced. That's why you see Anthony Bourdain on CNN, or you did for a while. Um, there was also this, um, this need to satisfy revenue um, goals by preaching to your choir, by preaching to your dedicated audience, and that ended up creating confirmation loops that ended up being expected. Um, so I, I would say that that really had a big impact early on. And then add into that the idea that you can't believe what's in front of you, the idea that you can't trust your sources, the confusion over the ideas between an unnamed source and an anonymous source, two very different things, um, and the kind of oversimplification of the news process. I think all of those things had an impact um, and created more skepticism, not all of it healthy. Um, the blurring of the line between commentary and opinion and conjecture and news, that's huge. Um, we try to untangle that every single day. I'm going to speak, let somebody else who does more with the immediate tips speak to their tips. Well, just two cents there is I love when people send me records, you know, to go back to the value of records. I mean, it, it, you know, it's it, if you can just quote the document you're handed, that's much better than I heard or you should. But, you know, short of that, it's great to know what questions to ask. Tips are very valuable in that way. Uh, uh, some way to reach you. Uh, you know, I got a, I, I got an email recently from somebody deep throat, and it was just like a, a PDF that I didn't know what it was. And I said, what is this? And why do I care about it? Deep throat, if you're out there, just I don't know what that was. Just follow up. And I just never heard back. But I think people are really worried about being having something traced back to them. But oftentimes, you'll get an anonymous tip and you genuinely don't know who it is. You have to coax them into like, okay, the the the, the question behind like ninety percent of our questions for in it for when somebody brings us a tip is how do you know that? How do you know that so and so is doing such and such a thing? And and often it's well, of course I know. Okay, well, how do you know? Like, how am I going to prove that to my readers? That's a really interesting story. But how do I show that? How do I demonstrate that? And and so you know, those follow up questions, if there's some way to reach you so we could uh, flesh it out, I think that's just a very practical thing. Just even if it's an anonymous email that you fire off, check that fake deep throat account that you set up for the purpose of emailing me an hour later for when I said, that's interesting. Tell me more. Yeah, because the, the skepticism comes from like the journalism of assertion versus the uh, journalism of uh, verification. And that's what we're, we try to do is show you why it's true and here's the document or here's the source that said it we have that great newsroom mantra uh great story if true uh um i think we're about where we should wrap up um thank you for being here um as we've said we're right here on the second floor just right around the corner from the um cafeteria area or open eating area there's a big sign on our door that says boston globe you should come in stop by say hello um we're here constantly um and uh and and to emphasize and bring it back kind of full circle we really um are enjoying ourselves as you can probably tell uh, we like this job uh love it and uh we really want to hear from people we want to be even more kind of entrenched in this community um lots of plugs here uh, if you haven't signed up for roadmap yet, very simple. Just send me a blank email to rinews at globe.com. We all get rinews at globe.com. So if you want to send tips, um, Haunted house. ghost out. stories, yeah. Amanda is like on the ghost hunt <laughs> crazily. So yeah, sure. I'm going to hand this up. <laughs> so one more tiny thing, our landing page, our homepage is not behind the paywall. You can peruse all the headlines. You can see what we're doing. It updates multiple times per day because these guys churn out amazing stuff. And the easiest way to get there is globe.com slash RI. We even shortened up that enormous URL. So it's really easy to find. Um, but, but 
um, rinews at globe.com will reach all of us at any time. And, um, and you can also sign up for email alerts. So we'll send you our newest stuff, the push alerts through the app. There are a million ways to reach us. Um, please reach out. We're happy to hear from you and we wanna know what you wanna hear. Hour, your money back. <laughs> Ignore him. Thank you guys. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you.